Um, don't neglect that. These are serious ones. So take them home, look over them throughout the week, pray over those things. It's a blessing when you pray over a request and then someone comes to church and says, man, let me tell you what God did. Isn't that nice? To know you get to spend some time and pray over that and see what God did through it. Uh, it makes it, look, we say we serve a big God. And we talk about how great our God is, how faithful He is. The truth is that sometimes we need some reminders. <laughs> and the greatest, I think one of the greatest ways to get a reminder of that is by being involved in prayer. And you get to see how personal God is. And when it's personal to you and you invest in it, then you see God come through on it. It's not just like, oh, praise the Lord. Yeah, hey, praise the Lord. It's a good, good praise in church. Amen. It, it's, man, that was something I prayed over. And God moved, right? All right, uh, Romans chapter number 11. Romans chapter number 11. And uh, let's go to uh, Romans 11 and verse number 25. And again, the, the context here is uh, Israel as a nation. And this is uh, our fifth mystery in the study. We're talking about the restoration of the nation of Israel. Uh, and, and that is because we're going to see there's blindness in part that's happened there. Uh, Romans 11 verse 25 for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. That's a mystery. And God doesn't want you being ignorant of it. So uh, pay attention. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits. Now, Paul is ri writing to the Gentile church, primarily a Gentile church in Rome, and the saints that are in Rome. And because of that, he says, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. Why? That blindness in part. Now, if you don't have it underlined, and if you don't have it highlighted, I encourage you to do that. That blindness in those two words, in part, is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election... They are beloved for the Father's sakes, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God is not an Indian giver. He's not going to give you something and take it back. Aren't you glad he doesn't do that with your salvation? <laughs> All right? And so when it comes to the gifts and callings of God, as it relates to the nation of Israel, all right, God is, what he's saying there is, I'm not done with them. All right? And, and I, I can't stress this enough. There are people that try to teach. There are, within the independent Baptist churches, there are those that are, now buying into the idea, they're, they're small in number, but there are still some, that are buying into the idea that God has pushed Israel aside and he's done with them. And if you read this and you believe the Bible, and you read word for word, and you just take it as what it says, you do not walk away with that idea. All right, Someone has to insert something into this passage that is not there. Now, I want you to go back to verse number 25, and uh, I want you to notice that it mentions there, the fullness of the Gentiles. It says that blindness in part has happened to Israel until. All right? So there's a time frame for this. It is not forever. Thus the term in part. All right? And the time frame for that is until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Right now we're in the times of the Gentiles. But eventually that time will be full. And God will then again turn his attention back onto the nation of Israel. All right, uh, look if you would at, uh, uh, go to Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, Luke 21, and, and this is Wednesday night Bible study. Every once in a while on a Wednesday night, if I, if I feel God wants me to preach a message to you, I will, but in Bible study, the, the greatest blessing, of, I think, one of the greatest blessings of being in a Bible-believing church is you actually study the Bible by going to the passages of Scripture, all right? And if you've been around for a while, been in a bible leading church, you can take it for granted. I can tell you this is not how Bible study goes in a lot of churches. Bible study in a lot of churches is someone gets up, they go, okay, here's this passage, here's what I think about it. What do you think about it? All right, that is not Bible study. That's called Bible opinion, all right? And uh, you don't need that. You don't even need my opinion on the Bible. You know what God says about it. All right, and that's what this is about. So look at Luke 21, and uh, verse number, oh, go back to, let's see here, verse 21. Luke 21, verse 21. Now what 
is the context. There is a parallel passage. If you're taking notes in your Bible or in a notebook or something like that, there's a parallel passage to Luke 21. It is Matthew chapter 24. And we will look at that tonight as well, uh, Lord willing. And Matthew 24 and Luke chapter 21 specifically discuss the time of the tribulation and the coming of Jesus Christ. When I say the coming of Jesus Christ, I'm not referring to the rapture, but rather when he comes back to establish his kingdom on the earth, right? So that's the context for Luke 21. Look at verse 21, and he says, look, there's going to be some bad things that happen. The verses prior, you read about that. And in verse 21, it says, then, when you see these things happen, let them which are in Judea flee the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter there into, for these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. A prophecy. All right? The prophecy that's given in the Old Testament about the nation of Israel and the tribulation they're going to go through, all right? these things must be fulfilled. All right? Look at uh, verse number 23. But woe unto them that are with child, and them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land. Underline it. The land. Which land? The land of Israel. All right? Great distress in the land. If you, if you want to see it again, look at verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. Underline that. All right? This is not talking about the church. All right? The, the church is not made captive uh, uh, of all nations. All right? We end in glory. We get raptured out of here. All right? Now, that doesn't mean the church doesn't get persecuted. All right? But the church, does not, the church is not a nation. Therefore, the, the nations are not its enemy. But a nation can have nations of enemies. And that's what you have with the nation of Israel. And it says here in verse 24, And Jerusalem, there's the land from verse 23. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. Look at this. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. All right. Look in uh, Ezekiel chapter 30. Go to Ezekiel chapter 30, Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 30. Now, there, uh, back when, uh, and I, I don't know if we're going to cover this, uh, I'm going to get ahead of us, even if we are going to look at this later, I'll, I'll just go ahead and sneak peek it to you. Um, back in the Old Testament, when God is talking about the nation, he's talking to the nation of Israel, and he's telling them about going into the land of Canaan, he talks about the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. All right? In other words, as a nation... The Amorites were on, an, think of it like this. Think of the nations being like an hourglass. And God says, okay, I'm going to give you so much time. And eventually your time is going to run out as a nation. All right, think about this. Where is the kingdom of Persia today? Where is the kingdom of the empire of Rome? The empire of Greece. Greece is a fifth-rate nation. They're in bankruptcy. The, the mighty nation and kingdom and empire of Greece, they're, they're an afterthought in, 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 in world politics today. That wasn't always the case. What happened? Their time ran out. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full, he says. All right, so the Gentiles, as, as, as the Gentiles, the nations are concerned, we have a clock that we're on. And guys, I don't know about you, but it sort of seems like our clock, our, our hourglass is running thinner and thinner. Like there's a little bit less sand every day that goes by. All right, and I know America is not in, I can't prove that America is actually in prophecy. I can't prove that. All right, there are people that would say, you know, that when God bears the nation of Israel on the wings of a great eagle, people try to insert America in there. I, I can't do that, guys. All right? Uh, and, and so I can't insert America in there, but I'll say this. At this point in time, America still is the superpower to destroy. All right? And it looks like if anything happens, we're going to be imploding from within. To me, it's just one more notch on the sign of times in the fact that the, the, the times of the Gentiles, man, it's running thin. It's running out. All right, look at Ezekiel chapter 30, and look, if you would, at verse number uh, 2. Son of man, prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord God, how ye woe worth the day. All right, and that, that is what every kid says when their mom is upset with them, right? Woe worth the day. For the day is near, now look at this, even the day of the Lord. We're not going to study this right now, but we studied a long time ago, the day of the Lord 
is a phrase that, that oftentimes is connected with the second coming of Jesus Christ and the judgment that Israel goes through in the tribulation and the judgment that God brings on the nations for turning their backs on Israel when he comes back to establish his kingdom. So he says, look, the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day. Look at this. It shall be the time of the heathen. All right? Man, the heathen are going to get wiped out. Uh, and there's a connection there with the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled in that taking place. All right, look at one more place, Daniel chapter number 9. Daniel 9, and we'll move on from this thought. The idea is there, there is a specific time for every nation. And uh, right now, uh, as a whole, the Gentiles are definitely running things. But it's not always going to be that way. And for that reason, Paul says, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. Think about this. When Paul's writing the church at Rome, who is the world power? Rome. <laughs> And so he's writing a bunch of Gentile Christians, for the most part, in Rome. And he's saying, look, uh, I don't want you being wise in your own conceits. Eventually, your time's running out, as, as, as far as nations go. All right? Daniel chapter number 9, verse number 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, to restore and to build Jerusalem, unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks, that's sixty-nine weeks, and those weeks are not weeks of days, but weeks of years. So seven times sixty-nine, all right, and that gives you from the time of the building of, uh, rebuilding Jerusalem till Jesus Christ, and then it says this, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people, the prince that shall come, now, now stop right there, but not for himself. There's the crucifixion. He's cut off. Then it goes on with this thought, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. You just went from first coming, all right, the first coming of Jesus Christ to the tribulation in one verse. All right? that, that's, 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 a, that's a one great testament to the fact that man did not write this book. You've got thousands of years covered in one verse in prophecy. All right? And he says that shall come the, uh, and destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. All right? And so again, there's an end. There's an end. End of the war. End, end, end. Where do you think about that? He that shall endure unto the and tribulation, the same shall be saved. That's not written to the church. We'll see that later. The point is this. There is a time frame, all right, and that God has for the Gentiles. And it's going to come to an end. And we're not there yet, all right? But we're getting closer. And then the church gets raptured out. Tribulation takes place. And you know what God does? He starts turning his attention away from the Gentiles' nations back onto his beloved, the apple of his eye. All right? So, again, is God done with Israel? The answer is no. Now, let's go through some other things here. Go back to Romans chapter 11. And I wanna, I'm just going to fly through some of the things we already looked at by way of review. And uh, he says that, that in, as it relates to the gospel. Now, now, understand this. Even today, America and Israel, for example, as nations, have an amicable-ish relationship. It was better before the current president. I'll say that much. All right, but amicable relationship. But you know what you cannot do as an American? You cannot go there and overtly go and preach the gospel. Can't do it. You can't go as a missionary. There are, now I will say this, I know missionaries in Israel. I'm not going to say their names. <laughs> All right, I know some men and their families that are there. All right, you know how they have to go? They have to go sort of through other means. They have to say, well, I'm here on a work visa, or I'm here to, you know, as a teacher to teach English or something like that. All right, so what, why does that matter? Because here in the passage, look at Romans 11, verse 28. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. Now, when Paul writes to those early Christians, they were that much more their enemies. The Jews were taking people, throwing them into prison. Paul was one of those Jews that did it before he got saved. And he said, look, for the gospel's sake, they're your enemies. But look at this. But as touching the election, and that's not Calvin's elect, right? Uh, that's another matter in and of itself. But this is talking about the nation of Israel you cannot miss this, all right? It, the context is not the church. If you try to insert the church here, you have made the Bible say something that it does not say, all right? And so the context we see is Israel. 
And he says, as touching the election, they are beloved for the father's sakes. Now, we went through this last time. Who are the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The covenant that God had with Abraham was unconditional. He says, look, I'm going to give you this land, and I'll make your seed great. And that's it. That's, that's the, there's no condition on that. All right? And so what happens is that covenant is passed from Abraham to Isaac, from Isaac to Jacob. Now, well, we went through this last time. What people will oftentimes do is they'll say, well, I'm, you know, God has replaced Israel, the physical Jews, with us, the church, the spiritual Jews. Anybody ever heard that before? All right. Uh, I, I've heard it a few times. Um, that's not accurate. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Because even though Paul addresses the whole spiritual Jew thing in Romans chapter 2, he goes on in the very next chapter to discuss the differences between Jews and Gentiles. Romans chapter 3, he does that. And then in 1 Corinthians 10.32, he talks about Jews, Gentiles, and the church of God. So even though spiritually in Christ there's no distinction, physically there are some things that God promised to a physical nation that still haven't taken place yet. All right? Let me give you this. People say, well, they got their land back. No, they didn't. They got back a portion of their land. That, that thing, I wish I had a map for you to, tonight, but the, the, what they have is the state of New Jersey. All right? And what they ought to have is, you know, Montana, Colorado. It should be a whole lot bigger than what it is. And when, God, when the Lord comes back to establish his kingdom, he gives that back to them. The, the reason why, guys, and this is an amazing thing, one of the reasons why I'm so convinced that I've got the right book, no one can explain what is going on in the Middle East. No one. They have tried for years. Every president goes in there going, we're going to try to bring peace, and they always fail, right? And the reason for that is no one understands. The answers are right here. You're not going to have peace over there until the Prince of Peace comes back, all right? Uh, so, again, what's in the name? Why does this whole thing matter? Because in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, God will refer to Israel as a nation in two ways. He'll call them Israel. He'll also call them Jacob. Jacob was the man's name, who was one of the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. All right? So what that does when you see Jacob, when you see mention of the 12 tribes, like in James, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, that shows you this is not a spiritual Israel. This is the physical nation. All right? uh, and so it is very important to get a hold of that. All right? And people will play games with that where the Bible is real clear. Now, you have the Abrahamic covenant. Did you get this yet in Sunday school? Sort of? Okay, all right. You have the Mosaic covenant. And the Mosaic covenant is conditional. God gives them the law and says, okay, if you keep my law, I'll bless you. I'll keep you in your land. If you worship the gods around you and you reject my law, then I will spew you out of the land like I spewed the people out before you. Uh, however, even in that, he says, but if you repent, I'll let you come back. Now, this is a verse that a lot of Christian politicians like to use, and, and I understand why, but let me just be clear with you. It wasn't a verse that God gave to America, all right? Uh, go to 2 Chronicles chapter number 7. It's a verse that God gave the nation of Israel. Now, I think you can say that as, you know, if you want to take and apply spirit to the church, okay, fine, but it's not what it's talking about, all right? This is a, this is a thing that doctrinally applies to a nation. All right, 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, and um, this is during uh, Solomon's dedication of the temple, and this goes along with the Mosaic Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant being the law, all right, and look at uh, 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14, if my people, which are called by my name, now look, I've seen this, and I, I am a, I'm a patriot, I appreciate our military, you know, love America. But I've seen, you know, these drawings of Uncle Sam, you know, bending down and the verse there is underneath it. And it's not really what it's talking about. Uh, we tend to try to take a lot of things that apply to a, another nation and take it for us. We do that with Scripture. The church does that with a lot of stuff that really belongs to Israel. All right. And look here, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, let me say this. Up until the last five words, I can apply it to the church. But the healing of the land has nothing to do with the church, guys. We don't have any land. <laughs> God didn't promise us a physical piece of land on this earth. God promised us something up there. Amen? Lay up your treasures in heaven. Right? Now, what is that written for? Because, as we're going to see, when, when you basically turn your back on God, the land physically gets corrupted. And we'll see how that connects with Israel here in a little bit. 
All right, but the point is this. God gives them the covenant of Moses, and they're supposed to keep it, and when they break it, they get kicked out of the land. However, if they repent, God said, okay, I'll bring you back, and I'll heal your land, and I'll forgive your sins, and I'll, I'll reestablish you. All right, so even in the Mosaic covenant, there's a way for them to get right. So everybody goes, well, they turned their back on God. Oh, okay, that's true. All right, but how about the Abrahamic covenant before Moses' covenant that was not conditional, and it was not based on them keeping the law? It's just like my favorite, one of my favorite things is when someone says, tithing is Old Testament law. Right, that's one of my favorites. You guys realize Abraham tithed before the law? All right? And you want to split hairs doctrinally, Abraham was tithing before the law. All right? And Abraham, hey, look, same principle applies with the Abrahamic covenant. This is before Moses gives the law. And before Moses gives the law, you know what God says to Abraham? I'll give you this land. Then when God gets this big group of people, he goes, okay, let's set up some rules. <laughs> All right? Let's, let's keep, and you know that's true about anything. The more people you get involved, the more rules you've got to have. You know what happens in a small church? Everything sort of, hey, shoot from the hip, we'll make it work. And as you start getting more and more people, you realize, you know, we've probably got to put some more structure into this thing. Right? Have you guys seen, noticed that, those of you that have been around the last couple of years, there's some more structure you've got to put into things the more people you get. And so you know what God does with the nation of Israel? Oh, man, we've got a lot of these. And boy, they're not all as good as Abraham was. And I've got to give them some rules. Amen? And so they turn their back on God. God kicks them out. But Abraham's covenant is still in place. All right? Now let's fast forward. New Testament. All that you read in the Old Testament, so-and-so begets so-and-so, and so-and-so begets so-and-so, and so-and-so begets so-and-so, it's there for a reason. And what it deals with is the promise that God gave to Abraham about making this great nation and about giving them the land and, and the promise of his seed being established. How did he say how long? Forever. That's what he said. And so you read all through the Old Testament about the kings. And this king was a good king and this king was a bad king. And, you know, this king followed the ways of Ahab and this king followed the ways of King David. That's the comparison oftentimes it's given. All right? And this king did more wickedly than any king before him. And this king did more righteous than any king before him. And all these, that's the contrast. Well, then finally they get a perfect king. What do they do? They kill him. <laughs> right? And now let me tell you what the Catholic Church did with the nation of Israel. They called them Christ killers. And you know what's interesting about that? There's two parties involved with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. One is the nation of Israel, no doubt. All right? But the other one's Rome. And the Roman Catholic Church is pointing the finger at the Jews saying, you guys killed our Savior. You guys killed... Hey, man, you guys were working together on that one. Remember that. Rome was involved. All right? Uh, but the point is this. The kingdom is offered to Israel. Matter of fact, you'll remember there in, uh, in Matthew uh, where he says, Elias has come. Remember he said before the great and notable day of the Lord, uh, Elijah, Elias, the New Testament form of Elijah, he would come back. You know what Jesus Christ tells those people? Elijah did come. And then the, it says he spake of John the Baptist. You know what that tells you? That is one more thing that points to the fact that everything was in place right there and then. Had the nation of Israel accepted their king for tribulation to take place, Rome was in power, just like it's going to happen here in the future. All right? Everything was in place for tribulation to take place right there and then. And you know what they did? They said, we have no king, but who? Caesar. Caesar. That's right. All right? And so they reject the, the, the kingdom of God, and as a result, they also reject the kingdom of heaven. And, uh, and you know what they say? Uh, go to John. Go to John 19. John 19, because this is important. It's important you see this. John 19. Again, it's a mystery, and it's a mystery because it's blindness in part. And uh, I guess, you know, if you think about it, why is it so mysterious? Because to everybody else, they look from the outside and they go, for sure God's done with that people. I mean, look what they've been through. And why would he want them? And they rejected him, you know. And so from the outside looking in, it looks pretty bleak. And then you go further into the tribulation, it looks like, man, he's hands off and they're totally done for it. All right, now, but but it, that's why it's a mystery. He's not done with them. All right, John 19, and uh, look, if you would, at verse number, oh, let's see here, verse 15. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. 
Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he to him, therefore, unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. Uh, go, if you would. Uh, I want you to all see Matthew. Go to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. So this is the conversation that Pilate has with the, the, the Jews that are there. Now, you also have to consider that some of those same people that were laying out the palm leaves and saying, Hosanna to the highest, you know, they're giving Jesus Christ glory as he walks into Jerusalem on the donkey, you know, and they're, they're all, you know, praising him and all that. Some of those same people are probably in that crowd. You know what they're saying? Crucify him. That shows you the nature of man. When someone compliments you or they're praising you, just understand it ain't going to last long. All right? You know why? Someone else is going to like what they're saying. They're going to find dirt on you. Or those same people are going to eventually turn on you. So just understand that praise is short-lived. Look for the praise of man. All right, look for the praise of God, not the praise of man. Um, but uh, Jesus hears that praise, and within a matter of days, they're saying, crucify him. Now look, if you would, at verse 24. When Pilate, Matthew 27, 24. When Pilate saw he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person see you to it. I heard a message one time, powerful message, and it, made, it really stuck in my mind. I wonder if Pilate still there in hell, wringing his hands, trying to wash those hands. And he looks down, there's blood still there. And he washes, blood still there. And for eternity, he's going to be trying to wash his hands, and it won't get clean. You better thank God you got saved. Amen. Thank God you're saved, and your sins are clean. Your sins are washed away. Your soul is clean. Uh, look, if you would, in the very next verse, though, verse 25. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us. Look at this. That's not a good move. Bad move. <laughs> His blood be on us and on our children. So what they've been through and what you see, the, the, the dispersion of the Jewish people all over the world and the persecution, it doesn't matter if it's Russia and the gulags, if it's World War II and the Auschwitz and you know, Brownau and all these different, these different camps in Poland where these people were taken and, and burned and, and, and consumed in these incinerators. Whatever the case is, they have had a, a history of suffering and it's been consistent since they rejected their Savior. You know what they said? His blood be upon us. Now, why is that important? Look at Numbers chapter 35. Numbers 35. Now, keep in mind that Abraham's covenant for God's nation is unconditional. And God is still going to fulfill that. But the law is the law. Numbers 35. And look, if you would, at verse 33. So ye shall not pollute the land. Remember we just read that God would heal the land? Remember that? All right. Why would God need to heal the land? Because the land was polluted. How did it get polluted? Through the shedding of innocent blood. Look at Numbers 35, verse 33. So ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are, for blood it defileth the land, and the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. So you know what's gone on for the last 2,000 years? Those people have suffered and suffered and suffered and suffered. And eventually, eventually, we're going to see this. All Israel shall be saved. And the Lord heals their land, but they're not there yet. Which is why you still see the conflict and you still see the problems that they're going through over there in the Middle East. All right, go back to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. So where does this leave Israel? Now, what you have right there is the United Nations, the little, and you know what's funny about this? You know what this is supposed to be? An olive branch for peace. <laughs> you know what you have here? You've got the United Nations, and they've got a particular nation in their crosshairs. <laughs> and that nation is the nation of Israel. All right, now that's a, that's, a, that's a play. That's not typically how the UN flag looks or anything like that. But it's to make a point. And the point is this. With all the, the atrocities and the, the lack of humanity in the Middle East, you know where they spend most of their time saying the atrocities are happening? They're saying they're happening at the hand of the Jewish people. Nothing could be further from the truth. Am I here to tell you that every Jew is innocent and they're doing anything wrong? No. Am I saying the Jewish government does not do things wrong? I didn't say that either. 
But I'm going to tell you right now, if you're objective and you look at the Middle East, you've got a whole lot bigger problems as far as, you know, uh, uh, human trafficking and slavery and the treatment of men to men. All right. Uh, and, and it's an amazing thing. The, 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 the same people that here in America say you've got to have bathrooms that allow these transgender people in are the same people that are saying the nation of Israel is a problem over there. And they're the only nation that will not kill homosexuals. For being homosexual. Isn't that, something is, does anyone ever see, think about that? Like there's something wrong there. What is the thing? Well, the thing is this. They're not to be reckoned among the nations. And there's a healing of their land that needs to take place. And it hasn't happened yet. All right. Now, the question is, okay, in light of all that we're looking at, where does it leave Israel? Romans 11, verse 1. I say then, have God cast away his people? God forbid. I don't know how anyone can take this and twist it any differently. All right, he says, for I also, not, he didn't say I'm a Jew. Right? He didn't want you to miss it and think, well, maybe he's talking spiritual Jew. He said, for I also am an Israelite. Let's go a little step further. Of the seed of Abraham, let's go down past Isaac and past Jacob, down to a certain particular tribe of the tribe of Benjamin. So Paul gives you his credentials and says, hey, look, God's not done with the nation. God forbid. All right, look at verse 11, same chapter. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them, Israel, to jealousy. And uh, again, this, again, it points back to the fact that God is not done with them. Where does this leave Israel, all right? Now, look at verse 26, same chapter. And so, Romans 11, verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion, underline it, the deliverer. That's important. And shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Now, you may not have noticed it, but you got two things going on there. The deliverer points to a physical salvation. Being delivered from something. All right? The latter part of that, turning away ungodliness from Jacob, that sort of goes hand in hand with healing their land. That's a spiritual thing. All right? So there's the deliverer. And then there's the, the turning away of ungodliness from Jacob. All right? right now, in, in, in the tribulation, God refers to the city of Jerusalem as Sodom and Egypt. That's bad, spiritually. All right? and, and you can study about what Sodom and Egypt are associated with in the Bible. And so, but, but here what you see is the physical salvation and the spiritual. All Israel shall be saved. All right? Now, what happens is that nation gets dwindled down to a remnant. All right, go to your Old Testament. We're going to look at this. Uh, Isaiah chapter number 10. Isaiah 10. And so there's a, there's a remnant of believing Jews today. There is a remnant. There's a, there are some Jews that will get saved and place their faith in Jesus Christ today. That's not the majority. All right? That, that's a small minority. They are a remnant, if you want to use that term. And Paul talks about that in Romans 11, verses 4 and 5. However, there's going to be a remnant during the, during the time of tribulation. Uh, look at Isaiah 10 and uh, verse number 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such are as are escaped of the house of Jacob, physical nation, shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. Look at this. The remnant shall return. Now, why does that matter? Because in Luke 21... And in Matthew 24, you know what the Lord tells those Jews? He tells them, when you see these signs take place, know that the time of tribulation has come. And he tells them to flee from Jerusalem. He tells them, go to the mountains, get out of Dodge, <laughs> go. But here he says, the remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. It's not just a matter of them returning to their land, but a matter of them returning to their God. All right. And so what you have is you've got a deliverer coming out of Zion, Physical salvation in the tribulation when he comes back. And turning away ungodliness from Jacob. Them returning, not just to their land, physical, but to their God, spiritual. All right? Verse 22, for, through, uh, for though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. All right? So again, the point is this. They are a great nation, but man, by the time they go through tribulation, a lot of them get wiped out. And then there's just a remnant that is left, and they flee and then they, get, they come back. They don't come back till their king comes back. All right? Um, look at Isaiah chapter number 11. Go to Isaiah 11, one chapter over. 
Isaiah 11, look at verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. Who is this? Jesus Christ. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. There's a cross-reference to Matthew 5, verses 3 through 5, the meek inheriting the earth. That's in the millennium. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. There's a second coming, Revelation 19, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. All right, that's mentioned. Go to 2 Thessalonians real quickly. And again, what you're reading here is the second coming of Jesus Christ and uh, the restoration of Israel. 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. You know what Paul said? Uh, much studying is a weariness of the flesh, right? <laughs> 2 Thessalonians, and uh, look at uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed. That's the mystery we'll look at next week. Whom the Lord shall consume with what? With the spirit of his mouth. You just read it in Isaiah. All right? In Revelation, a sharp, a sharp sword goes out of his mouth, and with it he should smite the nations. All right? And he mentions there in Isaiah 11, a root. And what you read about in Romans chapter 11 is the olive tree. And we're like a wild olive tree that's basically, we're, we're grafted into the nation. But you know who the root of that nation is? You know who the root is? Jesus Christ. And so we're grafted in because of him. All right? And Paul makes the Gentiles in Romans 11 very aware of the fact that, look, you guys don't belong to these promises. You don't deserve to be saved. But he grafted you in. You weren't a part, naturally, of the nation of Israel. You weren't a part of these promises. God brought you into these spiritual things. All right? But he says, all Israel shall be saved. Uh, look at Ezekiel chapter 36. One more time, Old Testament, to see again, it's a physical and a spiritual salvation. Physical, because they're running for their lives. They're being persecuted by the Antichrist. And spiritual, when God uh, restores them to himself. Ezekiel 36. Verse 21. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do, this not, I do not this for your sakes, <laughs> O house of Israel. And there's the mystery. That everyone's looking at it and going, Why would God even, why would he even still deal with them? Well, it's not because there's something great. It's because of his own name. It's because he said, Look, I... I promised you something. My name was on that, and I'm going to keep my promise. That's how great of a God we have, guys. And he says there, For my holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither you went, and I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. That's not happened now. It hasn't happened yet. It doesn't happen until he comes back. Look at verse 24. This is it. Underline it. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then, once he's done that, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. You shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. There's the spiritual side. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments, and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness, spiritual, and I will call for the corn, and will increase it physical, <laughs> and lay no famine upon you. And you watch that thing back and forth, spiritual, physical, spiritual, physical. Why? Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. And when the king comes back, they're both there, and he offers it back to the nation. All right? So all Israel shall be saved, the remnant that's left after the tribulation. They will be saved physically, all right, but also spiritually. Now go to Matthew 24. Boy, we're running out of time. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. We're not going to read this entire chapter. I want you to just look at it, uh, get familiar with it, understand it's that cross-reference uh, passage I mentioned in Luke 21. 
And this is uh, the uh, great tribulation. Uh, verse 3 is the context. In verse 3, at the end of the verse, the disciples are saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? Uh, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And in verses 5 and 6, you have false Christs and wars. In verse 9, it talks about the Jewish people being hated of all nations. Verse 13, enduring to the end of the tribulation. That is not written to a Christian. All right? You are not having to endure to the end of your life to be saved. That's not even what the passage says. It's the end of a time of tribulation. All right? Verse 14, the gospel of the kingdom is preached. Verse 15, the abomination of desolation. Verse 16, those which are in Judea flee. All right? Verse 27, the coming of the Son of Man. Pick it up there. All right? That talks about Jesus Christ coming back. Verse 28, it's the battle of Armageddon. Look at verse 30. Then shall appear the sign of the, the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. There's the Gentiles. And they shall see the, sign, the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. The elect, you, you can see this in verse 22, is a reference to the nation of Israel. It is not the church. And the point is this, when he comes back, he gathers them back together. And he brings them back to their land, and he also brings them a spiritual salvation. Now, what has to happen? What has to happen is he has to reveal himself to them. Now, for sake of time, I'm not going to look at all these references. If you want to write them down, they're there for that reason. All right? Uh, but I want you to see Zechariah chapter number 12. Zechariah chapter 12. So how does the Lord bring them back? What does He do to restore them? Zechariah 12, look if you would at verse uh, 10. Zechariah 12, uh, verse number 10. And it says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. All right. Now look back at verse 9. It's going to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. There's Matthew 24. There's Joel chapter 2. There's out of Zion shall come a deliverer. All right. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. Here's, here's the clincher right here. And they shall look upon me, that's the nation, whom they have pierced. That's the nation looking at their Savior. All right? And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day there should be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadarimon in the valley of Megiddo. There's Armageddon. Here's the point. You know what God does? The Lord comes back. He brings his, his elect nation back to him in the land. And he says, look, you guys followed the wrong guy for the last three and a half years. I'm here to set everything right. And he says, look, touch the, look at the prints in my hands. Look at these nail prints. You guys crucify me, but I love you. And I'm going to restore you to myself because I made a promise a long time ago and I intend to keep it. That is what happens with the nation of Israel. So in the meantime, in the meantime, and again, blindness in part, we understand that. There's a veil on their hearts today. In the meantime, you know what you ought to learn to do? Psalm 122 says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. You ought to pray for that. You say, I thought I was supposed to pray for Jesus Christ to come back. Well, if you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you are inadvertently praying for Jesus Christ to come back. All right? Because they can't have peace until he comes. So the point is this. We ought to stand with Israel. Now, I understand that our politicians don't always do that. But I would ask you to pray that God has mercy on us and that we have some people that have enough sense not to turn their back on the nation of Israel. And even if our politicians and even if our government, even if we as a nation turn our back, you pray for them. And you stand with them as an individual. And as far as churches go, I, I, want, I want everyone here to understand, New Heights Baptist Church and God's people that are here, we stand with Israel because they're God's chosen people. And so that's the conclusion of this thing. God's not done with them. All right, There's still some things he needs to, 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 uh, to accomplish. And they're going to go through some really rough stuff in the tribulation when we're gone. Uh, but eventually, they will be restored to Jesus Christ. So that is blindness in part happening in Israel. Again, it's in part not forever and not with all of them. So that's it for, for tonight. Next week, we'll get into mystery number six, the mystery of iniquity. Who is the Antichrist? We'll talk about that uh, next Wednesday night. All right.